This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Khan Nam. And I'm Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we have a really exciting show today. We're going to be reviewing with one of the foremost uh, critical analysts on despotic rules and strong arm rulers in the Arab world and Middle East, Professor Assad Abu Khalil. And uh, it's kind of timely since we've recently had what appears to be the rather untimely death of a Palestinian activist, uh, Nizar Benat, we'll, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And finally, later on in the show, we're going to talk about probably the most disturbing thing that the apartheid Israeli regime is confronting. And it's not Iran, and it's not Hamas, but it's the dramatic change in public opinion about Israel in the you know, in the American psyche. So we've got a lot to cover today and a lot of uh, very interesting topics. That's right. So first, we'll, we're going to listen uh, to this interview with Dr. Asad Abu Khalil. He, he talks about the history of normalization with Israel. I mean, uh, what happened or what's happening recently really is not something new. And of it's course, not. he talks about U.S. Uh, foreign policy and uh, the role of the media. Let's watch. The second half of 2020 has seen an accelerated rate of normalization of ties. The Abraham Accords were signed with the UAE in August. Bahrain followed a month later and Sudan's transitional government announced normalization of relations with Israel in October. Then this was followed on December 10th, 2020, Israel and Morocco agreed to establish diplomatic relations. Joining us to discuss this and more, Dr. Asad Abu Khalil, Professor of Political Science at California State University, Stanislas. Welcome again to Arab Talk, Asad. Yeah, ahlan. Welcome to, to you. Ahlan, Azizi. So uh, last September, you wrote a very interesting article saying that Gulf despots know that the quickest uh, road to Congress is through Tel Aviv right. and that the, the Saudi crown uh, prince, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, a.k.a. MBS, was behind the scenes role in normalization with Israel. Please explain what did you mean by that? Yes, Jamal. The thing is, Arab governments or Arab despots really have been in search of ways to ingratiate themselves with the American government for many years and decades. And unfortunately, that principle of coming closer to Washington through Tel Aviv by getting closer to Israel has also been followed and pursued by the Palestinian Liberation Organization under Yasser Arafat. So Yasser Arafat, I think, uh, one of the ways, one of the many ways in which he thwarted the revolutionary Palestinian revolutionary potential is by insisting that the road to Palestine is going to pass through Washington. And that the road to Washington passes through Tel Aviv. So as a result of that, he basically offered everything he got to the Israelis in the hope of getting American support. I mean, he did get American support for a while, but it was American support for the dismantlement of the Palestinian resistance movement. I mean, the American government even insisted on the revision of the Palestinian Charter of 1968, which basically was the agreed upon program of all Palestinian people and factions and so on. The Arab despots in recent years, especially since the invasion of Kuwait, has really basically decided to become very blatant in their attitude to the Arab-Israeli conflict. Because, I mean, Arabs always knew that the Gulf governments were never supportive of the Palestinians. They were afraid of the Palestinians, especially with the rise of the Palestinian resistance movement of the 1960s and 70s. They wanted to avoid antagonizing them because the Palestinians were armed and they were powerful and they have capabilities. But once the Palestinians have been disarmed by virtue of Oslo and by virtue of the disastrous policies of Yasser Arafat, the Gulf governments are not afraid of the Palestinian people anymore. And that's why they are showing their true face. And their true face is one of collaboration and normalization with Israel. Let us remember that the great president Nasser of Egypt, since the 1950s and 60s, have correctly pointed out that these are not with the Arab people, that these are not with the Palestinian people, that these Gulf despots 
are mere agents of colonial powers and have always been under the table collaborating and cooperating with Israel. Let us remember that in the 1960s, during that war of Yemen, which was intended to exhaust the forces of the Egyptian army, the uh, the Gulf governments uh, received the assistance of Israel along with the assistance of the American, the British, the French, and all that. Uh, So this is not a new episode. Basically now, Gulf governments are not afraid of Arab public opinion. They are not afraid of Palestinian movement. And they decided to show uh, that they are really in the same trench with Israel. And they've always been there. I mean, this is why we all on social media mocked the UAE foreign minister when he famously said that he is tired of the war with Israel, as if he or his royal dynasty have ever exerted a drop of blood or effort for support of the Palestinians. I think you're saying something very interesting here because uh, I'd like to differentiate between governments and people because you're saying, just to make it clear, that the governments are not afraid of their own people because uh, I, I assume most of the people in the Arab world don't follow in the footsteps of their government. They still support the Palestinian cause. Absolutely, Jamal. I mean, we have evidence of that. One public opinion after another for the last several decades all point out that the Arab population, all the way from North Africa to Saudi Arabia, are solidly behind the Palestinian movement, are solidly opposed to normalization with Israel. In fact, and it's not surprising to me at all, Saudi, the Saudi people are one of the most anti-Israel people in the entire region. I mean, if you look at the most reliable, the Arab Center public opinion surveys, which have the largest sample and the most reliable uh, methodology for sampling Arab public opinion, all point out that Arab are unanimous against normalization. And for that reason, normalization between UAE, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia under the table with Israel required an increase in the level of repression in those countries because they know where the population stand. I mean, I, I can tell you anecdotally, uh, you know, several years ago, I did a speaking tour on British universities from the south all the way to the north. And many of the people I met on college universities, and this was a tour for BDS, for opposition to Israel and Zionism and so on. And many of the people I met, many of the students who were receiving me during those talks were from Saudi Arabia. And of course, they were doing that against the knowledge of the government, which do not allow them to, which doesn't allow them uh, to to participate in activities against Israel. Another interesting thing you talked about in your article is that you believe that uh, MBS still holds uh, sway over some Western media outlets. Uh, you stated that he often uses the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg to float uh, trial balloons for Western audiences. Does this still hold true? Absolutely, Jamal. I mean, much of the think tank in Washington, D.C. are in bed with Gulf governments. If it's not Saudi Arabia, it is UAE. If it's not UAE, it's Qatar. All these governments have financial ties to the think tanks. And they also have ties to journalism. I mean, Western mainstream journalism can be quite corrupt. I mean, the UAE ambassador in Washington, D.C. has been notorious of having these lavish parties to which he invites famous journalists who during the day they cry about human rights and democracy, but at night they are attending special showing of movies and so on at the house of, at the mansion of the UA ambassador. He also flies them over to Bahrain to attend Formula One. I mean, uh, and and, and we know from the Shahs of Iran and the book by James Bill, The Eagle and the Lion, that the Shah of Iran and the Shah's embassy in Washington, the Iranian embassy at those times was extremely active in uh, seducing the famous journalists of Washington, D.C., Tom Brokaw and Barbara Walters and so on, with gifts and caviar and Persian carpet and so on. Mm. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, the scene is quite corrupt. And there are also financial ties. The independent newspaper of England has financial ties with with the Saudi government. Bloomberg has financial ties with the Saudi government. And the list is quite long. They're using the same uh, methods uh, in silencing uh, dissents on now social media, just like Israel does with Palestinian voices. Uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, they go after Facebook actually to remove posts uh, that uh, that they deem anti uh, their government. You're absolutely right. And the penalty for tweeting in disagreement with the government 
is extremely stiff in both Saudi Arabia and UAE. Imagine if you tweet in support of Palestinian struggle, you will get a 15 year in prison in both countries. Wow. And despite that, despite that, I have to give credit to many brave Saudis and Emiratis who have, despite all the, all the pressure, and in Bahrain, have been tweeting in support of Gaza during the last, and in support of uh, Jerusalem in the last conflict. So people are taking risks. I mean, I know a uh, Saudi intellectual who I will not know, I will not name, because he was put in prison merely because what he does on Twitter for so many years is passionate advocacy for the Palestinians. Imagine, that man is still in prison He's a secular Arab nationalist because he tweets in support of Palestine. Wow, incredible. Shifting gears here, um, President Joe Biden promised that his foreign policy would mark a major departure from former President Donald Trump, uh, pledging to put human rights and democracy at the center of his approach to global affairs. Yet... We have not seen him condemning the killing of uh, Palestinian children in Gaza by Israeli bombings or the ethnic cleansing that is uh, happening right now in, in Jerusalem. Uh, do, do you actually believe or do you expect that there'll be a shift in U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, especially Absolutely. when it comes to the question of Palestine? Absolutely not, or any other where in the world, for that matter. I think we should be, you should address this question to the likes of Noam Chomsky, and others who made the argument of lesser of two evil. These are the people who told us that it's important to vote for Biden because it's going to make a change in some areas of policy, domestic or foreign. I think we have seen very clearly in some areas, Joe Biden has been worse than Trump. Uh, with the war in Yemen, the United States is more involved than ever in supporting the Saudi brutal war in that country. On the question of Israel, there's absolutely no daylight of difference between the Biden and the Trump administration. Uh, if anything, I think the Biden administration has been quite aggressive in silencing any voices that are critical of Israel with, with great uh, militancy. And we saw on the question of sanctions against Iran as well as sanctions on Russia, this administration is extremely militaristic and uh, they want to continue the policies of previous administration in projecting more military force and endorsing all Israeli aggression no matter where. So how are they going, going to sell this human rights uh, approach to the rest of the world? Well, you know that it doesn't sell in the Arab world. It may sell in Washington, D.C. with the mainstream liberal media that want to believe that liberal administration or democratic administration are rather more humane than Trump's administration. I mean, in reality, it's not like that at all. And in some cases, in fact, it could be more sinister, especially as we saw this administration, I mean, just to point out some hypocrisy, Biden, when he was running for president, called Saudi Arabia a pariah state. He said about Mohammed bin Salman that he cannot find one redeeming quality in that man. And what have we seen since he came to power? The officials of this administration has been making most fawning, pathetic statements in Saudi media about the strong alliance between the two countries, how the United States is obligated to offer military support for Saudi Arabia. Uh, they have been extremely explicit in support for the Saudi regime and for the security of the ruler. Uh, I mean, uh, that shows you in a, in a nutshell the inconsistency between the rhetoric before he became president and what he says now. Well, there is more actually inconsistency and hypocrisy. Uh, and this is something that you're very familiar with. Uh, last month, Secretary Blinken tweeted and this, this was on World Press Freedom Day, that the United States continues to advocate for press freedom, the safety of journalists worldwide, and access to information and on and offline. Um, I'm quoting him here. A free and independent press ensures the public has access to information. Knowledge is power. Yet recently, the U.S. government shut down uh, Al Alam, the, the Iranian TV network Al Alam, uh, Al Masira and Press TV websites. Uh, I mean, what do you make of this? Well, I mean, it's consistent with the U.S. government. I mean, the U.S. government, basically, this has been the work of the Israeli lobby. The Israeli lobby, as we know, have consistently lobbied for silencing all voices in support of Palestine, no matter where they are. And they have succeeded. I mean, look at their success in convincing the U.S. government 
Democrats and Republicans, that criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, that opposition to Zionism is anti-Semitic. Never mind that many Jewish intellectuals and philosophers over the years have opposed Zionism, have opposed the state of Israel. Uh, but but that they want, they want to muzzle our, vo- our voices, and it is not it is not an exaggeration to say that the Zionists in America have become the biggest enemies of freedom of speech on college campuses as well in the U.S. media. And Democrats and Republicans are just going along. And let us remember this muzzling of voices, this shutting down of news websites and stations from the United States happened under the Biden administration and not under the Trump administration. Uh, they will go to that lens. Basically, what they are saying is Israel and the Zionist lobby want to prevent all media from the Middle East to ever arrive into America unless it is sanctioned by Israel. And that is going to be Israeli media, UAE media, and Saudi media, and Bahraini media. That's the only thing they want. I mean, they've been trying to shut down Al Jazeera as well, even though I'm critical of Al Jazeera, but even that they don't like. They just want absolute loyalty to the Zionist program of aggression and occupation. Do you think that the biggest problem now is social media or alternative media since, uh, I mean, they've managed to kind of silence many of these outlets, uh, even even Al Jazeera. uh, Well, that's a whole different story uh, that they couldn't make it right here in the United States. That's their mistakes because they didn't know how to navigate the the market here. But uh, what about all these different platforms, because uh, young people, and, and, and I know that you teach a lot of young people, they don't rely on, uh, on television anymore. You're absolutely right. And for that reason, the Zionist organization in D.C., especially the ADL Anti-Defamation League, have been very active with these big, big tech companies in order to have them adopt censorship standards that are basically derived from the foreign ministry of Israel. I mean, it is for that reason Facebook and all social media have been censoring our voices. I was expelled from Facebook for my advocacy for Palestinians. And I think we should expect more of that. For that reason, we should try to find alternative social media that are coming out in the world, maybe from other countries, uh, that would be free of the intimidation by Zionist organization in Washington, D.C. But you're right. We have seen during the last war on Gaza and the confrontation in Jerusalem that the Zionists are very unhappy about the social media because they cannot control the message. They cannot control the narrative. They cannot control the images. We are able, Palestinians in Jerusalem, in Gaza, are able to deliver their own media to the world. And the world is able to see. And this is why the Zionists were freaking out during that confrontation. You're absolutely right. And they've, I know that they censored you. They've, they've shut me down for, for, a, for a day. Uh, and then let me back in. And uh, they hide behind, which is really interesting, actually they have more power than uh, government's uh, social media because they don't have to respect your First Amendment. Right. They hide behind the terms of service. So right. they kind right. of like say, you know, we don't like you. We don't, we don't have to have you there. You're absolutely right. And let us remember that the big tech companies, Twitter as well as Facebook, are in close contact not only with the Israeli government, but also with the Saudi government. MBS was hosted at Twitter as well as Facebook, uh, and they do business with them. And for that reason, they are able to have them adopt their censorship policies. And we are suffering as a result. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've actually been looking into this and did a lot of uh, shows about it. And then you said something very important, which is there is the commercial aspect because uh, they make a lot of money. It's not just uh, just the policy itself, but they actually, with advertising, they make a lot of money from uh, countries uh, in the Gulf, the UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia, and so forth. Absolutely so, true, absolutely true. I mean, big tech companies, as you said, have become a violation of our freedom of speech in this country. And unfortunately, the liberals are going along with them because the censorship policies of big tech companies are in sync with the liberal standard. For that reason, when, when, when outrageously Facebook uh, and Twitter banned Donald Trump, the liberal media were cheering. These were supposedly the advocates of freedom of speech and the First Amendment. Instead, we should all be appalled by the censorship, whether against Trump or against us or anybody else. Liberal media are accomplices in the censorship policies of big tech companies. Because they agree with them. Right. Yeah, I actually... 
uh, was against the banning of, of Donald Trump because I knew that's going to lead to more exactly. censorship to others. Exactly. If it, if it can happen to Trump, it can happen to all of us. It can happen to the Palestinian people in the world. So a, a new poll, I don't know if you've seen it. This, this came out uh, within the past, I think, 24 hours on American attitudes toward, toward a core conflict in the Middle East finds that about half of Democrats want the U.S. to do more to support the Palestinians, showing that a growing rift among uh, Democratic lawmakers uh, and this is also reflected in the party's base. The poll is conducted by the Associated Press, uh, NORC Center for Public Affairs Research, finds differences between the Democratic and the Republican parties on the U.S. approach toward Israel and the Palestinians, with liberal Democrats wanting more support for the Palestinians. And of course, uh, there, 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 there hasn't been any much any change uh, from the conservative uh, Republicans. I mean, is this a glimmer of hope that we're seeing at least some change within the United States? Uh, first, uh, I have not seen that poll. I follow these polls very closely, so please send me a copy of that. What year did you come to the United States, Jamal? 75. Wow, 75. I came to this country in 83. But I can tell you, from the time you came to America and from the time I came in 83, uh, the policies of the American public towards the Arab-Israeli conflict have shifted markedly. In in other words, when we first came, liberal Democrats were the staunchest, more fiercest Zionists in the United States. These were the biggest support of Israel. And Republican, in contrast, were the more likely to be critical of the state of Israel. Now it has switched. The bedrock of American support have become American conservative, especially evangelical Christian, Southern Baptist. They are the most vocal for Israel. In the liberal Democrats, it's totally different. We see now more opposition to Israel among liberal Democrats. And if you go do it by age, you will find young liberal Democrats are far more likely to be critical of Israel than previous generation of liberal Democrats. The Democratic Party basically now is split half-half between those who support Israel and who support Palestinians. However, I am not very optimistic on that for, very, for many reasons. Because if you look at liberal democratic parties in Europe, and even socialist parties like France, we, you fi- and, and the Labour Party in England and so on, you find that even though the rank and file are more sympathetic to the Palestinians, the leadership is not. So the socialist party of France is extremely pro-Israel, even though the rank and file are opposed to Israel. Why is that? Because the, manage, the, the interests that run these parties there are big financial interests, political interests, managed to ensure that nobody should come to the leadership who is not beholden to the Zionist interests of that country. I mean, the same is true of, uh, uh, of what happened in the Labour Party in England. We had one exception in Jeremy Corbyn, and look at the war against that man. Look how much he was vilified, called names. Uh, I mean, he was basically called a traitor and an anti-Semite. Because well, don't you think not... there is a similar campaign to vilify AOC, uh, Rashida Tlaib, no uh, no uh, Ilhan that. Omar? Even though, even though they are more timid than I would like them to be, but you're right, there is a campaign against them because those represent basically the rank and file of the young liberal Democrats of the uh, Democratic Party. And they don't want that to happen. And the Zionists are freaking out about, about that because we saw the rhetoric is changing. I mean, I remember mayoral candidates in New York City, how much they used to compete in praising Israel. Notice in this last campaign, in the mayoral race, it wasn't like that. So there is a change afoot, but it's not necessarily going to be translated into policies. Although I have to tell you, during the last war in Gaza, to see that Chuck Schumer, of all people, stayed silent, and to see the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in uh, uh, in, the, in the Senate, Menendez, uh, being quiet about it, uh, or even voicing my criticism of Israel, that to me is a seed of change. Something is happening, but let us not fool ourselves. Change will come over there, by, our, by the people there, by their struggle. Anything we can do here to help is great, but change does not come from the Western metropolises of the United States or the continent. What about the role of the media? Uh, did, you, did you notice any change uh, in the recent example with Gaza, the publishing of the Palestinian children faces uh, in the New York Times and maybe MSNBC and, and, and others, but uh, 
I, I don't follow the TV media, but the print media I follow closely. And I would say there is a very small, mild change. But ultimately, the racism at the root of the problem remains. Western media have a race problem, racist problem. They don't view us Arabs as equal a human being to the Israelis. They don't think that our lives are valued in the same way like Israelis. That remains to be the case. And for that reason, as long as that is the case, and as long as Zionists have wield tremendous influence in intimidating the media, media is not going to change. Those changes are cosmetic. If you see the cover of the New York Times and the Washington Post, it's still extremely frustrating. Dr. Asad Abu Khalil, thank you for coming on Arab Talk. Thank you very much, my friend. Take care. That's the voice in the face of Professor Assad Abu Khalil, uh, Professor of Political Science at Cal State Stanislaw, really one of the foremost authorities on, on, on these topics, Jamal. And it's always very interesting and compelling to hear Professor Abu Khalil's analysis. I mean, he really puts things in perspective. And, you know, this this thing about what's happening right now is not really new. It's part of an ongoing you know, basically repetition of uh, U.S. Uh, foreign policy uh, in the region, this this kind of attempt at normalization. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, I don't think there is going to be a change under the Biden administration. Unfortunately, I mean, we've, we've witnessed firsthand the reaction from the Biden administration, whether it's uh, President Biden or Secretary Blinken, when uh, uh, over 50 uh, Pal uh, Palestinian children were killed in Gaza, and the reaction was that Israel has the right to defend itself. They keep uh, repeating this uh, phrase, uh, no matter what. Uh, I, I don't know. I think uh, public opinion, as you said, is shifting. Certainly it's shifting within the liberal uh, you know, section of the... Uh, no, uh, but democratic, but actually, uh, Jamal, establishment. it's it's actually shifting across all sectors. And if you look at some of the data from this uh, report that came out, it was very interesting, and I think will ultimately be the biggest threat to the the stranglehold that APAC and Israel supporters, Israeli supporters in the United States have over the U.S. Congress, because. Basically, overall support for, for Israel has decreased across all sectors. Liberal, conservative, white, folks of color, doesn't matter. It turns out that the biggest supporters of the apartheid state, Jamal, turn, if you're a, if you're very old, very conservative, and very white, then you still have pretty darn strong support for the apartheid state. But everybody else actually has the view that Palestinians and Palestine should be treated more equally and more fa fairly, and that Palestinians are getting short shrift and short changed on all of these negotiations. It's a pretty dramatic change from just even five years ago, Jamal. Well, I have to agree with you when it comes to the American public opinion, to the grassroots movement, to a slight shift within Congress, but I'm not holding my breath when it comes to Congress, right. be it the Congress or the Senate or the administration. It's going to take many, many years and people have to elect fresh blood, new, uh, you know, you have senators who have been for decades, I mean, decades right. uh, on the dole of APAC. How are you going to change that? You're not going to change that. They're going to keep repeating the same thing. They're going to keep re receiving their marching orders from APAC. So unless you have a major shift in the makeup of the Senate, be it Republicans, which I doubt it, uh, maybe a little bit on the Democrat side. And we see even the uh, Congress itself, the I mean, the Democratic Party, it's split. And they've recently targeting those liberal uh, Democrats like uh, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and AOC and so forth because the establishment, I mean, I mean, see the statement uh, that was issued during the uh, attacks on Gaza by Nancy Pelosi. That's right. It wasn't any different than uh, Biden. It wasn't different than 
any uh, Republican senator. And, and, and you know, it, it's, it's the same line of uh, uh, old uh, and tired policy, but that, this is what we have so far. Well, I think that's right, Jamal, and I have to agree with you. We shouldn't hold our breath waiting for this dramatic shift. But I do think that the policymakers, the Israeli policymakers, pay very close attention to these longer-term shifts in American public opinion about what's happening among, uh, you know, what's happening, you know. Uh, what's being challenged, Jamal, is people no longer believe that it's in the strategic best interest to support the apartheid state of Israel in the ways that they've done traditionally. Um, that's a pretty dramatic shift. It has to occur at the grassroots level. It has to occur at the level of, you know, public opinion. That shift is welcomed by all, all parties internationally because we already see that Europe, Africa, Central and South America, the rest of the world is already on board with this opinion, uh, of supporting Palestinian rights to self-determination. It's only the United States that is lagging. And with this grassroots uh, change, Jamal, um, it has to start somewhere. As it turns out, the only people who really support uh, the apartheid regime of Israel anymore are white supremacists. That's that's their main uh, source of support here in the United States, old white supremacists who believe, you know, in this kind of rhetoric, which is causing harm, what most of us believe, harm to the strategic interests of the United States. And evangelical uh, Christians. I exactly. mean, this is what Israel relies on when it comes to U.S. politics. We'll come back to this, uh, Jess. Uh, uh, I want to talk about something really important and, yes. uh, and, and actually depressing in, in, in many which way. A Palestinian activist, yeah. uh, a well-known critic of the Palestinian Authority's leadership, uh, has died after being arrested uh, by its security forces. It's terrible. So the uh, Palestinian security forces, and this is um, this just happened within the past 24 hours. So we we're getting more and more of these reports. Uh, uh, Palestinian uh, security officers uh, detained Nizar Banat uh, at his home uh, near the occupied uh, West Bank city of Hebron. Uh, overnight, they raided uh, his house, I think, around 3.30 in the morning, according to family members. Uh, and he was badly beaten, according to family members. Uh, we probably will play a little bit of his video, even though it's in Arabic, uh, as um, to show uh, what really led to this, in my opinion, and many people's opinions and uh, human rights activists. Uh, Mr. Benat denounced the Palestinian Authority on Monday. He recorded a video which he posted on Facebook, uh, Jess, and mostly over the deal, we spoke about this, that uh, uh, Israel uh, basically uh, wanted to, to dump uh, one million uh, soon-to-be-expired coronavirus uh, vac vaccines That's on right. Palestinians in exchange for similar number of doses uh, from a shipment that the Palestinians are expecting later this year. So they right. wanted to give them, and we posted actually a picture of, of those vaccines right. which were, were expiring this month. And there is no way on earth the Palestinian uh, Authority in the West Bank, and especially, of course, if we talk about including Gaza, that they have the capabilities they don't have to distribute... Job. Uh, one million vaccines in less than a week. No, they, it doesn't uh, you know, we're happen. coming to the end of the month. That's right. And of course, you know the whole idea, the whole system of, of especially with Pfizer refrigeration, which makes it uh, very, very uh, complicated. So uh, apparently, there is some uh, uncouth uh, dealings with that shipment. And then until he started, people start to speak about it, and until he exposed it and so forth, then the PA swiftly canceled the deal. Uh, when the first uh, batch of jabs arrived from uh, Israel, uh, saying that they were uh, nearer to their expiry date than expected, someone signed off on that deal before. So this wasn't, you know. So that's the whole idea, and and why people are very upset and people like him. So what happened 
of course, security forces came to his house at 3 a.m. in the morning. Beat him up. According to, and I'm, I'm, I'm reading here, I'm going to read. So we have this accurately. Uh, according to a cousin of his, his name is uh, Hussein, who told uh, Reuters news agency, they kept beating him continuously for eight minutes. Uh, they did not come to arrest him. He, he said, if, they, if, if, if you came to arrest him, take him. He was, uh, why the brutality and why uh, right. the violence? Then, then there was an announcement from the hospital that he died there. And then uh, his uh, cousin, another cousin of his says, the announcement of his death at the hospital was a ruse. Basically, they, they beat him to death. This is what the family believes. And this is not, uh, by the way, this is not the first time that... Uh, no, uh, Jamal, not by any stretch. Uh, this is a very common, this is a very common uh, occurrence. Well, especially for him personally. I mean, this is, he has been arrested before. Uh, the last time, uh, I think it was a uh, few months ago, he uh, got arrested uh, for criticizing also the uh, new prime minister, Mohammed Shtey, and in, in, that, in, in, in that video he does, he actually speaks about this, and he also criticized the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the EU and other donor countries uh, uh, for uh, providing uh, financial aid to the Palestinian Authority, and I think this was very upsetting to the Palestinian Authority, he was like attacking donors, uh, uh, on several of the uh, his Facebook postings and in in interviews uh, and and uh, blaming them, you know, for basically uh, right, you know, creating an, an oppressive regime according according to him. So that's that's in in short, and and, and there were demonstrations in front of uh, in Ramallah, in front of Al Muqata. This is where. Uh, uh, the authority in Mahmoud Abbas uh, offices are, uh, which was kind of broken uh, down quickly uh, by the security forces. We're early on uh, just uh, uh, talking about this because uh, you know his death was announced today. Right, but isn't this isn't this part of the larger picture of what we've been talking about for decades now? Jamal is the lack of you know, true democratic processes going on in the Palestinian Authority. Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas is still the president. We still don't have elections. There's cronyism. There's corruption. And this is really what Nizar was all about calling out. I mean, because in a real democracy, in a true democracy, you should be able to criticize leadership, political leaders, in a way that brings about change, in a way that brings about greater transparency, and that allows people to feel more connected. So his, I mean, it's it's a death, but it looks like it, it was more like a murder, Jamal. I, I mean, if we're gets a political murder, a politically motivated murder, to talk, to kind of take the voice away of one of the leading critics of the Palestinian Authority. It's very, very sad and disturbing, Jamal, with all the problems in Palestine right now that something like this would happen. Especially after, you know, what Palestinians had to go through with uh, the uh, bombings of Gaza, the uh, Palestinians in Jerusalem are getting uh, attacked by uh, colonial settlers. Every Their day homes still. Are every day Every still. single day. Right. Also in Hebron. I mean, I mean, he's from Hebron. And Hebron is no stranger to these attacks. Right. I mean, we, we spoke about this. What's happening now in Jerusalem happened in Hebron almost two decades ago when right. uh, Israeli colonial settlers took over al Shuhada Street right in the heart of Hebron and ethnically cleansed uh, the Palestinian population from there. And basically now when you go to Shuhada Street in uh, in Hebron, you have to go through an Israeli checkpoint. If you're a Palestinian, you're not allowed to pass through. If you are a Jewish, you're allowed to pass through. Uh, I mean, you know, I've I've worked on a documentary there. I've I filmed it. I know exactly what's going on. And they are replicating the same thing in Sheikh Jarrah, where these settlers have taken over or trying to actually take over uh, all the homes. They've taken over some of the homes. 
and evict more than uh, 60 Palestinian families who, who live there, they now have a checkpoint. So you cannot go through right. unless you are a settler or, or, or some of the Palestinians who live there, they stopped it to traffic. So it's, uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, sadly, uh, Nizar Banat uh, has witnessed everything that's happening in Hebron. And it will be really sad if it will be determined because now his family is asking for an autopsy done not by the Palestinian authorities uh, doctor or uh, you know they want their own of course, medical of course you know, Jamal, to, to determine what should. caused his death yeah and of course uh, you know what caused his death you get picked up at three thirty in the morning according to his cousin you're beaten then they call you and they say come and uh, you know his body is at the hospital you know it's really really sad it's very depressing i don't want to even get into the blame game uh because uh you know but well, there is but, accountability has to happen but and those who are responsible have have to uh, those are has to be they have to be held responsible well that that's exactly right jamal from the top down not from the bottom right up as we see right happening in for example saudi arabia with mbs you know you always you put you give the order to assassinate uh, jamal Khashoggi, and then you sacrifice uh, through sacrificial uh, a few sacrificial lambs at the low level and say oh mbs didn't know about it these things don't happen in a vacuum so we call on the palestinian authority to really hold responsible those from the top down that's exactly right jamal and uh people need to be held accountable we want our listeners and viewers to know that the so-called palestinian security forces for you know this is part of the so-called security israeli security agreement were doing the bidding for you know uh the israeli occupation forces for many many years jamal and who has funded the Palestinian security agencies. It's been the United States government, which for, and you know, and other Arab countries, which for decades funded the security operations, trained them to be as brutal on their own population as the Israeli occupation forces have been on Palestinians. It's a sad day, you know, to have to hear a story about Nizar Banat being killed under these circumstances, when you think about, as you said, you know, everything that Palestinians in Jerusalem, West Bank and Gaza are going through and what we need in Palestine, in addition to removing the occupation, is the, the ability. For, and, you know, we know this, Jamal, Palestinians will speak their mind, the freedom to speak your mind freely and openly without fear that you're going to be picked up. Not by not by the Israelis, because we always fear that, but picked up by Palestinian security forces and then beaten and possibly losing your life. Well, here is the sad thing and the sad reality, and this is part and parcel of the Oslo Agreement. The Palestinian security forces, well, let, let me start actually framing this differently. When Israeli occupation soldiers raid uh, Palestinian territories or, or raid areas under the control of the Palestinian Authority, be it Ramallah, Bethlehem, Jericho, etc. The Palestinian security f forces are required to withdraw. They go back to their barracks or, or the Palestinian police, they withdraw to their police stations and allow the Israeli right. army Right. to calm the area, supposedly looking for what Israel terms as terrorists or what have you. They conduct arrest, they kill people. They've actually killed a security officer just right. recently. Right. Just right. You know, so 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 and to have I mean I mean you have a, a security force. What do you have a security force for? Why do you have an army for? Why do you have a police? To protect its citizens, not to go and target Palestinian citizens. And when Israelis target Palestinian citizens, you go into hiding. I mean, this is, this is the, the, the I don't know what to, to term it, this ludicrous part of this agreement that requires Palestinian forces to basically 
withdraw and hide in their police stations or in their barracks while Israeli forces go into Palestinian areas and arrest and beat and yeah. kill Palestinians. Well, of all the things that were devastatingly wrong with the Oslo agreements, Jamal, I agree with you. This is among the most painful, ridiculous uh, agreements that Palestinian so-called security forces cannot protect their own people. I mean, it's it's a sad day. And, you know, we're back at this thing. You know, there's no elections coming up that we know of. You know, Abu Mazen's still in power. Uh, the situation on the ground for Palestinians, Jamal, as you as you alluded to, in 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 East Jerusalem in Sheikh Jarrah, in Gaza still, is still horrific. And there's still kind of medical apartheid uh being being practiced. You know, that that the Israelis wanted to give Palestinians you know, soon to be, you know, uh, I mean, old vaccines, soon to be expired vaccines is part and parcel of the multitude of things that are going on in a very harsh way for Palestinians all across, you know, all across the area. It's pretty devastating. Well, this is not going to be the end of the story. This is actually the beginning of, yeah. of this story. We're going to keep an eye on it and monitor the situation and, and listen really to those who have witnessed it and, uh, and, and, and see what are, what's going to be really done about it. But listen, I mean, I if it's going to be just swept under the rug, this is I don't think that's going to happen. I think, and I think people are not going to allow it on the no, ground. No, I agree. I, don't, I, I think with the way the social, I mean, we talked about this in our last show. I mean, the world gets to see what's really happening in Palestine because of social media. But part of that world is also Palestinians, you know, 48, Gaza, West Bank, you know, refugee camps. This cannot be swept under the rug, Jamal, because the word will get out. Reality will get out. The results of the autopsy will get out. And the reality of what happened will get out. You're listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco. I want to go back uh, just to what you started talking about and talk about this new poll uh, on American attitudes toward uh, a core conflict in the Middle East, which finds about half of Democrats want the United States to do more to support the Palestinians, showing that a growing rift among Democratic lawmakers is also reflected in the party's base. This is actually how it has been. It was reported on right. Associated uh, Press, and then we should say that the poll was conducted by the Associated Press, NORC, Center for Public Affairs Research. And and uh, this is uh, just recent, it just was done within the past uh, a few, few days. And uh, it's uh, among uh, some just of the numbers, uh, just among Democrats, 51% say that the U.S. is not supportive enough of Palestinians. The sentiment jumps to 62% That's among right. Democrats who describe themselves as liberal. Uh, on the other hand, 49% of Republicans say the U.S. is not supporting enough of is Israelis. That's why there is no hope for re a redemption for the Republicans. No, but Jamal, that number is less than it has been in the past. I mean, we need to look at the historical trajectory of these numbers the numbers for the republicans yeah it's it's 49 percent, but it used to be 50 and 60 percent so we see an erosion of uh that kind of support which is really dramatic and listen 51 percent of democrats when you look at that that's a huge that's yes. huge Yes, yeah, as far as, as the Democrats, and then I should also add 42% of liberal Democrats say that they disapprove of how Biden is handling the conflict uh, compared with 31% of moderate and, and con conservative uh, ones. Um, let me see what else. A majority of Americans, 57%. Uh, think that there is a way for Israel and an independent Palestinian state to coexist peacefully compared with 39% who say that there is not that there is not a way 
Okay. Well, the 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 point being is that, and I, I'll I I will say what I said at, at the beginning of the show, Jamal. This freaks out the Israeli regime more than Iran, more than Palestinians, more than Hamas, more than you know Syria. Public opinion uh, is more frightening to the Israelis than anything else. American public opinion. In fact, well, the United States is the cash cow. For well, I was going to say when when you see that one of the first things that Naftali Bennett, the new prime Israeli prime minister, said, his main point is we want to get on better relations with Joe Biden and the American administration because they felt that Benjamin Netanyahu had caused a riff with the with the president uh, with President Biden. So Naftali Bennett, who is an avowed racist, an avowed ethnic cleanser, who really is committed to removing any sense of Palestinianness from historic Palestine, all he really cares about, really, Jamal, if you think about it, he doesn't care about changing the apartheid policies. He cares about having a better relationship with uh, Joe Biden. So these numbers... And whether or not they lead to political change, I'm skeptical. You're right. But these numbers are a are portending what the Israelis could expect in the future is not good. And the other number in there, Jamal, which really freaks just, out before, the Israelis. Before, before you continue, yeah. before I lose this thought, yes, yeah. and I want to post this also um, during the show, we'll post it. There is a very uh, telling... Uh, cartoon by the talented Carlos Latouf about Naftali Bennett uh, basically whitewashing himself right so he can so so he'll appeal to the Biden administration so that 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 uh, I'll, I'll also send it you know we'll share it with everyone but that's actually exactly what you you were talking about yeah you know he just he, he just wants everyone to to uh, forget that he, you know, was calling for the ethnic cleansing of Palestinian and bragging about killing Arabs and to show that he's a peace-loving person so he'll be on the good side of the uh, U.S. administration to continue the military aid to Israel. But Jamal, you and I have been talking about this uh, for so many years now. We've given presentations on this in large public forum. Uh there's no difference, and we've been we spoke about this last week and the week before. There's no real difference between left and right in in an apartheid state like Israel. One is more whitewashed. One is more the reality. And I've always been a fan of let the reality of apartheid speak. Why whitewash it? I think people should see what apartheid regime really looks like, Jamal. And Naftali Bennett and Benjamin Netanyahu are really no different, in my opinion. Well, you're 100% right. I mean, it's, I don't know, I mean, how convincing he'll be. I doubt he'll uh, be sure, convincing. I'm sure APAC, uh, the, uh, you know, the leadership of APAC, they're all sitting around the table, scratching their heads how they are going to whitewash him and present him to Congress and present him to the United States. Right. And this is something actually uh, we've had other guests uh, before who spoke to this uh, very uh, subject saying that Naftali ba Bennett is horrible, but he'll pose a major problem uh, for the Israelis because he's not as talented or as, uh, you know, as Netanyahu in basically, you know, pretending to be a peace-loving person and, and so forth. He, he just can't, even with everything else uh, that right. he's been trying to do, eventually he'll go back, you know. Well, uh, what's that expression? You can't, uh, the wolf, uh, what oh, is it? Wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. you know, he's eventually will be discovered as as well, I a don't, racist. I don't think there's any and, sheep's clothing. And a bigoted person. I don't think you there's any... Watch what <laughs> right, I don't think there's any sheep's clothes clothing on that one, Jamal. You've been listening to Arab Talk on KPO San Francisco. Go to our website, arabtalkradio.com, to download our latest episodes, and we will talk to you next week. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.